love roller coasters. I love that feeling when you first strap in, the anticipation, knowing there is no going back and you are fully committed to the ride. The bigger, the better in my book. I especially love you, that feeling when you get to that crest of that first hill, when you pause just for a second, and then swoosh, off you go. It was well over a decade ago that I truly strapped in to dedicate my life to creating a more gender-balanced world, and it has been one wild ride. That ride has taken me from the highest levels of Goldman Sachs into the world of women's philanthropy, and now to my role of CEO of a nonprofit whose mission it is to mobilize unprecedented resources for the advancement of women and girls. Tonight, I won't be talking so much about the why, why gender equality is so important. Instead, I'll be talking about the why now and the crucially important what next. Why might we be at that crest ready to take off for greater gender parity and what you all can do to get on board. As Pat mentioned, I was a partner and managing director of Goldman Sachs. In 1996, I was the youngest woman, only 1996, and first female trader. As one of very few traders, I spent a lot of time mentoring and recruiting and just doing whatever I could to advance the gender equality of trading, diversity of trading, and of the firm in general. In 2000, I was asked to leave my trading seat to take on a role in the executive office, where effectively that became my first time for full-time job. I was honored to serve on the firm's partnership committee, consisting of the most senior leaders of the firm that had responsibility for all areas of people management, compensation, performance measurement, recruiting, and of course, diversity. So this became my job. And increasingly, I became obsessed with the question of why. Why were there so few women at the most senior levels of the firm and in the financial services sector in general? The answers I found fell into a number of buckets. The first, women just weren't entering the field with the right backgrounds for a career in finance, the pipeline issue. Women were opting out because the nature of the work was too hard and maybe the travel was too demanding the work-life motherhood issue. Women just weren't that good at their jobs. The performance issue. Women weren't getting the help and support that they needed. The sponsorship issue. And lastly, more difficult to frame or explain or target, they just can't seem to encounter bumps or barriers around the way to do the differences and expectations, so styles, attitudes, or otherwise put norms. The other issues. We women, we got issues. <laughs> Actually, that's part of the problem. The framing of women's issues put diversity as a problem that needed to be solved rather than an opportunity that needed to be embraced and empowered. So what firms did, by and large still doing, address the first four things. Address the pipeline, fix the women, help them navigate the system, and offer flexible work arrangements. And yes, that has helped, but it's gotten us this far. Increasingly, I became obsessed with the system itself, obsessed with these other issues, which are deeply embedded in belief systems and unconscious biases and norms, which led to gender stereotyping, but are much harder to see and address at the heart of it was a dominant belief in a properly working meritocracy, when really it heavily favored those who fit a particular mold. So in 2002, I decided to leave Goldman, lead a place I'd been strapped in for 14 years, and had given me firsthand experience and insights as to why there were so few women in leadership and what it might take to get there. So it was no sooner that I left that I strapped myself in, not to another organization, but to a movement instead. Ah, the women's movement. I look for an instruction guide on how to get connected and how to use my time, treasure, and talent to make a difference. And guess what? Couldn't find one. And maybe that's why I've been trying to create it ever since. And so continued my learning while during journey for the advancement of women and girls. 
And for the past 10 years, I have been actively and intentionally funding nonprofit organizations that work on women's issues. I've traveled to get on-the-ground experience and knowledge. I've read all the research I can get my hands on onto why gender inequality, better yet, why gender equality. I've served on the boards of many, many women's nonprofit organizations. I joined business and philanthropic networks. And I really just met with anyone and everyone I could find who shared my passion and who knew more on how to create social change than I did. As my interest areas expanded from leadership and research into political empowerment, economic justice, health, education, safety, violence, I came to see how interconnected all those issue areas are and how a balanced and holistic approach to interventions is absolutely critical. I came to see how there's not an issue area where women's experiences are not marginalized. And there's not an issue area where the opportunity for greater impact is not lost because of a failure to account for difference, sex, race, class. After all this time, all this effort, all this money, searching for reasons to explain why are we continuing to marginalize women and not empower them? Why do we continue to see gender inequality as the problem and not gender equality as the solution? Do you know what I discovered? There's no good reason. <laughs> There is no good reason. There's no good reason to explain why, at this moment in our world's history, women are not more fully and equally and proportionately represented at all decision-making tables and at all levels of society. There is no good reason to explain why women and girls around the world don't have greater access to the education, the opportunities, and the resources they need to thrive. There is no good reason why we are not rising up together to end the extraordinary levels of violence against women and the world in general. There's no good reason. In fact, there is compelling and abundant research that narrowing the gender gap in political empowerment, economic access and opportunity, health and survival, and educational attainment is good for everyone good for everyone. So if we can embrace this, accept this, own this, then we can move boldly past needing to make the case of why. The why case, which includes the business case, the economic development case, the moral case, the why women and girls. This is the moment where we can mobilize our collective resources behind proven interventions and try new ones while being rigorously attentive to outcomes. So why is the moment now? Why is, is this the moment we're at that crest ready to take off? First, it is no longer just a fraction of women who are standing up for women's rights, but increasingly, all of us. And men are right there with us. I don't believe the framing that says when women gain men lose. This is not a competition. We are in this together. Can we say this together? To paraphrase Hillary Clinton, women's issues are human rights issues, and human rights issues are everyone's issues. Technology. Now we have the ability to share information, to mobilize, to connect in ways we've never had to before, never been able to before. Technology is democratizing power. A recent example of this is in the United States. It's when the Komen Foundation decided that they would stop funding Planned Parenthood. That news went viral, and people went crazy. And that decision was quickly reversed. That is power shifted. That is power democratized. Increasingly, people, and I hope women, are willing to use all their financial resources Yes, they're giving dollars, but they're investing dollars and they're spending dollars in greater alignment with their vision to create a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. Socially responsible, socially innovative, impact investing strategies are attracting billions in institutional dollars 
but have yet to go mainstream. They will if we ask for those products. So if you get this, if you accept this, then what can we do now? What can we do together to accelerate positive change? We live in a world where money is power, and we simply must use our investing dollars in alignment with our vision. Gender lens investing is the commitment to use your dollars to benefit women and girls. There are multiple ways you can do this, multiple. You can choose a mutual fund product that invests in companies that are leaders in gender equality. You can fund innovators, on, women innovators, on platforms like Kickstarter. You can fund venture capital funds that support women entrepreneurs. And you can even choose financial services providers that are leaders in workplace equity. We must support organizations that work on behalf of women and girls, and especially consider supporting women's foundations of which there are over 170 around the world that deeply understand that women's rights are human rights, and there's no short-term solution or silver bullet for solving gender inequality. What is needed is that we listen. Listen to those that are in need and partner with them to provide the resources they need for solutions they co-create. Studies have shown a very tiny percentage of global philanthropic dollars goes to women and girls on the ground. And yet we know, we know, without that, true change will never take hold. Yes, spend, invest, go shopping, but do it intentionally, do it thoughtfully. What we buy and who we buy it from are some of the most important decisions we make every single day. Every dollar, yen, euro that goes out of our pocket into someone else's pocket is a shift in financial power. Imagine the possibilities if we seek out products from companies that do more than just make stuff to make money, but who also make a difference. Globally, women control 20 to 30 trillion of consumer spending. Imagine if we were, for example, not to buy products from companies that do not have a critical mass, and many have none, of women on their corporate boards which to me is a clear indication of their commitment to running an inclusive organization and a commitment to be willing to represent the people that they serve. Imagine how quickly corporate boards would diversify. Economic rewards, economic consequences, to me, are the most underused tool we have to create social change. Lastly, storytelling. I love this quote by Harold Goddard. The destiny of the world is determined less by the battles won or lost than by the stories we have come to love and believe, them, believe in. We must lift up the stories of women and girls that are too often marginalized and silenced. We must lift up the stories of our women change agents and trailblazers and leaders and have their back. To me, the greatest recent example of the power of storytelling to ignite a movement is the documentary film series, Half the Sky, which introduces us to women around the world that are living under some of the most horrific and challenging and heartbreaking circumstances we could possibly imagine. I believe in their stories. I believe in our stories. A gender-balanced world is a better world for everyone. Let's get on this ride together. Strap in. Yeah.